You don't want to be in a place where there's no challenge. You might even quit your job if there's no challenge. You say, well, that's a good job. It gives you security. And you think, God, I can't stand this. It's eating away at my soul. It's all security and no challenge. So why do you want a challenge? Because that's what you're built for. That's what you're built for. You're built to take on a maximal load, right? Because that's what strengthens you. And you need to be strong because life is extraordinarily difficult. And because the evil king is always whittling away at the structure of the state. And you have to be awake and sharp to stop that from happening. So that you don't become corrupt. And so that your family doesn't become corrupt. And so that your state doesn't have to become, be, be, become corrupt. You have to have your eyes open and your wits sharp and your words at the ready. And you have to be educated. And you have to know about your history. And you know how, have to know how to think. And you have to know how to read. And you have to know how to speak. And you have to know how to aim. And you have to be willing to hoist the troubles of the world up on your shoulders. And what's so interesting about that, so remarkable, and, and this is something that's really manifested itself to me as I've been doing these public lectures. I've been talking about responsibility to people, which doesn't seem to happen very often anymore. And the audiences are dead quiet. And I lay out this idea that life is tragedy tainted by malevolence. And everyone says, yeah, well, we already always suspected that. But no one has ever said it quite so bluntly. And it's quite a relief to hear that I'm not the only person who has those suspicions. And then the second part of that is the better part, and it's the optimistic part, which is despite the fact that life is a tragedy tainted by malevolence, at every level of existence, there's something about the human spirit that can thrive under precisely those conditions if we allow that to occur. Because as difficult as life is, and as horrible as we are, our capacity to deal with that catastrophe and to transcend that malevolent spirit is more powerful than the than that reality itself and that's the fundamental issue I think that's the fundamental issue of the judeo-christian ethic with its emphasis on the divinity of the individual as catastrophic as life is and as malevolent as people can be and that's malevolent beyond belief fundamentally the, a person has in spirit the nobility to set that right and to defeat evil. And that, and that more than that, and that the antidote to the catastrophe of life and the suffering of life and the tragedy of life that can drive you down and destroy you is to take on exactly that responsibility and to say, well, there's plenty of work to be done and isn't that terrible. And there isn't anything so bad that we can't make it worse and certainly try very hard to do so but I have it within me to decide that I'm going to stand up against that I'm going to strive to make the world a better place I'm going to strive to constrain the malevolence that's in my own heart and to set my family straight and to work to work despite my tragic lot for the betterment of anything of everything that's in front of me and the consequence of that the immediate consequence of that is that when you make the decision to take on all of that voluntarily, which is to stand up straight, by the way, with your shoulders back, to take on that, all that on voluntarily. As soon as you make that decision, then all the catastrophe justifies itself in the nobility of your striving. And that's what it means to be an individual. I don't want to calculate high-resolution utopia for myself only to have it squandered by fortune. How do I ensure the meaning I experience is self-determined? Well, you can't because there's an arbitrary element to existence. So it is going to be squandered to some degree by fortune. But that's, that's not the point. What are you going to do? Just sit back on your laurels and wait for things to roll over you? So what you do, look, the hero myth basically says, <clears throat> go out there confront the dragon, get the gold, share it with the community, and, and, and live properly. Or it says, the alternative is, face the tyrant, <clears throat> enter the desert as a consequence because everything falls apart, recast structure, find the promised land. Those are the two elements to the hero myth. And, you might, and that's divine. It's, it's the closest thing to divine that we know. You might say, well, what happens if you follow the divine path? And the answer might be, well, everything turns out perfectly because God is on your side it's like no that isn't what happens because things don't turn out perfectly it's your best bet it's your best strategy right that's the thing and you know dragons wouldn't be dragons if they couldn't eat you and so 
But that's okay. That's okay. And this is something I found so useful about the biblical stories, especially about the Abrahamic stories, which I didn't know that well till I lectured about them last year. You know, God calls people to the adventure of their lives. And so you could say in part, God is that force within you, which calls you to the adventure of your life. And it says, get away from your family, get away from your blind and unconscious comfort and get the hell out there in the world. Well, God calls Abraham out from his fathers where he stayed far too long and from his kin where it's secure. And like the first thing he encounters is a famine. And then he encounters a tyranny inhabited by people who want to steal his wife. It's like you think, well, he, Abraham should have just stayed in bed and ignored God, obviously. Well, that isn't how it is. It's like we're built for struggle, us human beings. You, you're not after um, the bubbles of bliss that Dostoevsky described in, in Notes from Underground. We're built to contend with the world. We're built to contend with reality. You want a challenge. And the best way that you can take on a challenge, because a challenge fortifies you. So you don't want to be secure. You want to be strong. And you get strong by taking on optimal challenges. And so you lay out your destiny in the world and you take the slings and arrows of fate and you make yourself stronger while you're doing so. And you might fail and fortune might do you in, but it's your best bet. And you know, people have also, people have, had, have extracted unbelievable successes out of catastrophic failures. And so, and I'm not saying that in a naive way. I know perfectly well what happens to people. You know, you're doing fine in life and then you get cancer. And then six months later, you're dead. And all the heroism in the world isn't going to save you at that point. But that's not the point. That's not the point. Life is bounded by mortality. But that doesn't mean that you don't get out there and contend. And you develop by contending and you minimize the net amount of suffering in the world. And that's something, man. That's something to do. So it's, it's, it beats laying in your basement and getting bitter and then doing the terrible things that bitter people do. So. You can't ensure that the meaning you experience is self-determined, but you can play your role to the best of your ability, and that will be good enough. And that will be good enough. That meaning, the meaning that you will find in then in that, I believe, is sufficient to be sustaining, and perhaps even sustaining through the flood. So it isn't that you can avoid catastrophe, it's that you can prepare yourself to deal with it honorably when it arrives. That's what you've got. Now, this the baboon here, who's supposed to be basically just a fool when the story was first written, he turned into what's essentially a shaman across time. And the, so he represents the self from the Jungian perspective. Now, the self is everything you could be across time. So you imagine that there's you and there's the potential inside you, whatever that is, you know. And potential is an interesting idea because it represents something that isn't yet real, yet we act like it's real. Because people will say to you, you should live up to your potential. And that potential is partly what you could be if you interacted with the world in a manner that would gain you the most information, right? Because you build yourself out of the information in the Piagetian sense. But it's deeper than that too, because we know that if you take yourself and you put yourself in a new environment, new genes turn on in your nervous system. They encode for new proteins. And so you're full of biological potential that won't be realized unless you move yourself around in the world into different challenging circumstances, and that'll turn on different circuits. So it's not merely that you're incorporating information from the outside world in the constructivist sense. It's that by exposing yourself to different environments, you put different physiological demands on, on yourself all the way down to the genetic level, and that manifests new elements of you. And so one of the things that happens to people, and this is a very common cultural notion, is that you should go on a pilgrimage at some point to somewhere central, and that would be, say, like the rock in the Pride Rock in the Lion King, because you take yourself out of your dopey little village, and that's just the little bounded you that everyone knows and that isn't very expanded, and then you go somewhere dark and dangerous to the central place, and while you do that, you have adventures and they toughen you and pull more out of you, like partly because you're becoming informed, which means information. It means you're becoming more organized at every level of analysis, but there's also more of you too. And so that's a very classic idea. And then in, in cathedrals in Europe, especially at Chartres, there's a big maze on the floor, a circular maze, which is a symbolic representation of the pilgrimage for people who couldn't do it. And so it's a huge circle divided into quadrants, which is a union Mandela. And you enter the 
maze at one point, and then you have to walk through the entire maze, north, east, west, and south, before you get to the center. And the center is symbolized by a flower that's carved in stone. It looks like this. It's big, this maze, eh? It's, 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 it's large, so that you can walk it. And that's a symbolic pilgrimage. It takes you to the center. That's the center of the cross, because it's in a cathedral, and that's the point of acceptance of voluntary suffering. That's what that means. And so, you walk through Jung called that a circumambulation. You go to all the quarters of the world to find yourself. And so, well, the self is, is the baboon in this particular, in this, I think he's a mandrill actually, in this particular representation. And he lives in the tree. He lives in the tree of life. It's a baobab tree in this particular. So he's the spirit that inhabits the tree of life. And he's the eternal wise man. That's a way of thinking. So is the king. But He's, he's sort of a superordinate king or an outside king in some sense. He's the repository of ancient wisdom. And the king is the manner in which that wisdom is currently being acted out in the world. And so they're friends and that means that the king is a good king because if, they, if the king was a bad king, he would be alienated from himself and that would make him shallow and one-dimensional and that would make him a bad ruler. No union with the traditions of the past. To be a good ruler, you have to rescue your father from the underworld and integrate that. And of course, that's a main theme in this entire movie.